Okay. Uh, start a little short prayer. I thought about reading one, but then I forgot to bring it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This is a prayer that everybody, many people probably know. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, what's on my tiny mind? Oh, the, the, the title of tonight's, actually these things have titles, believe it or not. I probably haven't mentioned them before, but tonight's presentation is the seven arcs of salvation history. And remember, you don't have to take any notes if you don't want to because you can watch this tomorrow on YouTube. Um, but you can take notes if you want to. Anyway, here's where we're going to start. And this is going to be typical for what I'm trying to do every year. Next week's class is going to be the six components of the of the miracle food pyramid, which is also another suite from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to go through Genesis to Revelation tonight, too. And, of course, that would make sense that we're going to start with Genesis again. Just about every night we're going to start with Genesis. Just about every night we'll finish up in Revelations. Um, and everybody knows that, that Adam and Eve got made me with all, that, all those details a couple of weeks ago. But here's where I want to get to the important part about Eden. Have to draw already. What is the world coming to? It says this. A river rises in Eden to water the garden. Ooh. And if a river rises... It means that the river, that Eden is a high spot. So Eden is up here. We haven't even drawn it yet. It's just a place where the river rises. Beyond there, the river divides and becomes four branches. One of the, the name of the first is the Pishon. I never heard of it, so who cares? It is the, the next, it runs through the land of Havilah. Who knows, who knows, who knows? Blah, blah, blah. The second river is the Gihon or the Gihon. I don't know, it goes through Kush. Here's what gets interesting. Then the fourth river is the third river is the Tigris, and the fourth river is, Euph is Euphrates. Now we know something we can talk about. Yes. And there's the two rivers, and those are the two rivers of the four that are flowing out of Eden where the rivers rise. Yeah. It says, the Lord God gave the man this order. You are free to eat from any of the trees of the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and bad. From that tree you shall not eat. The moment you eat from it, you are surely doomed to die. <gasps> now you know this is just like when I was a kid. Is I remember... Looking up in the in the closet, I was like six years old. Looking up in the closet in, in the den, and some bottles or something up there with the interesting colored bottles with stuff in them. I said, "What's that?" And a parent said, um, "Those are adult things to drink." I said, "What are adult things to drink?" They said, that "It's they have alcohol in them, so things adult drinks." I said, "Can I have some?" No. So of course, what do I want to drink? I want to try that alcohol? Finally, got big enough to climb up there and taste it. Disgusting. There some, must be some lesson in there. Well, they might taste quite compelling now. Um, anyway, <laughs> so you know what's going to happen. Uh, here we are. Remember last week we covered this, this high point of the end of the, of the second chapter is that the man and the woman were both naked, yet they felt, felt, yet they felt no shame. And, of course, remember that the first commandment was to be fruitful and multiply, which they must have done. And if you get up to the top of that creation graph that we looked at is up at the very top. The last thing that's kind of really created is the marriage, which continues to create the human beings and continues all the creation. What could be more swell than that? Well, nothing. Anyway, it says this part. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, I love this tone. Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? <laughs> But the, and and uh, you know she says, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It's only the one in the middle that God said, you shall not eat it or even touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. He just doesn't want you to know what he knows. If you eat what he, if you eat from that fruit, you're going to become like God. This is like the classic temptation, as far as I'm concerned. Sooner or later, everybody thinks they're smarter than God, and you know we're always wrong. And usually that has a lot to do with where sin comes from. Anyway, so the woman saw that the tree was good for, flu for food and pleasing to the eyes and desirable, so she took some and she ate it. This is my favorite part. She also gave some to her dim-witted husband who was with her, and he ate it. And both of their eyes were open and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. Now, you know, they, they probably weren't covering their heads. They were probably covering their genitals. And, and my theory is that, is that God... Remember, I was talking about how, how all the power of the universe is God's love. Any power that we exercise is indirectly or directly, depending on how you look at it, coming from God's love. And the most powerful, the most powerful force that human beings can work with, that God gives them, 
is sexual power, the, the power to create new human beings, to freely decide to create new human beings, which, you know, I mean, dogs make more dogs, but they're not making any decisions, they're just in heat. But humans get to choose that. And, and a, an idea I have in my mind is that, is that when the, the most powerful thing that God gives you, if you misuse it, it produces the exact opposite, the most powerful negative thing. I think that's why so much of the bad stuff in the, in the world comes from misusing sex. Gets everybody in trouble. Bible's full of it. Probably two thirds of the pages have to do with people messing up because of sex. Anyways, they, <clears throat> so, my goodness, my mouth is dry already. So they heard the sound of the God of God moving around in the garden. As we know, he had some kind of physical physical presence that we don't understand. And I love this part. God says, "Where are you?" And of course. Y'all tell me, does God know where Adam and Eve are? Yeah, of course he does. He knows everything. Why is he asking them where they are? My opinion is, it's their chance to own up. It's their chance to say, okay, okay, we're, we're sorry, we're coming out. Um, we ate from that tree and we shouldn't have. And I always think that that would have been a moment if they had repented. At that moment, maybe, maybe things could have been fixed. I just don't know. And the other thing is, of course, is Dimbo Adam, the wife comes up and says, here, you take a bite of this. Oh, okay, chomp me. That was your opportunity. You could have said, no, get over here, Mr. Snake. You just have to stomp on the head and back to happily ever after. So anyway, I kind of blame the husband because he had, <laughs> he had the chance to look out for his wife, and he did, and he was just, just milk toast. So here's what happens. God is very upset. He says, why did you do such a thing? And the woman said, well, the serpent tricked me into it, so I ate it, which is the same the man said, the woman tricked me, and I ate it. Oh, yeah, it's always somebody else's fault. There's this picture we have in Sunday school from um, what used to be the doors of the baptistry in a German cathedral, um, <coughs> Hildesheim Cathedral. And, and the picture is God, and he's like pointing, pointing at, at, at Adam like this. Ooh, and he is mad with that finger. And Adam's over there like with one hand, he's covering himself up and with the other hand, he's pointing over Eve. And then, oh, and then, and then further over is Eve and she's like scrunching and she's covering up one hand, she's pointing at the snake. And it's like classic, you know, the kids love it. They get this like, yeah, yeah, oh, not my fault, ain't my fault. You know, go, somebody else's fault. Find me a scapegoat. I don't want to have to repent. So anyway, that's what happens. Now you know what happens is, God tells him, you can't be in Eden anymore. So, let's look at Eden a little bit like this. Let's say it's kind of a little round place, maybe. Because, because the thing about Eden is, there's some trees growing up inside Eden, is that, is that Eden is, a, is described in, in the Bible as being a locale. It's right. It's here where these river, rivers rise, the Tigris and Euphrates flow out of this elevated Eden place. And of course, then, I don't know how big it was, but it was nice to tend the garden. Adam and Eve probably had a good time. But now, they are out. And I want to I wanna have everybody understand that there's an arkiness about Eden once you're thrown out. It's a theme that will carry all the way through to the end of the Bible, is that now Adam and Eve are outside the garden. And look at their sad faces. And look, you've got a little thing right there to cover them up. And Eve is a pretty little thing, but you know, she's sad. Look, at she's crying healthy tears. <laughs> <laughs> she got her little thing too. Okay, now, here's the deal, is they used to be in Eden where it was great. Now, they're outside. They're outside looking in. And this is a lot of, of what arcs are in the Bible, is what's outside is, is sullied and sinful and flawed and messed up and <laughs> it's not very nice. And then the ark, the container, whatever the ark is, has got something inside that's much better than what's outside. And usually it's so nice, it's so, it's so pure and clean and unspoiled that the stuff that whatever's out here can't even, can't even touch the outside of the container, can't even touch the ark, much less get into it. But human beings, ever since this, they're always like peeking over the top of, of looking back in, you know, if only we could get in. And of course, you know, the cherubs and their big flaming swords get lost. Okay. So, that's kind of the first, the first arc of our little story. And so far, I seem to be keeping on schedule, which is kind of incredible. Uh, moving on, and I guess everybody can guess what the next arc is, right? Noah's Ark, yes, genius at work. Now, 
I love this little introduction. By the way, did anybody see the movie Noah that came out about a year ago? I love that thing. I don't know if everybody else doesn't love it, but I just ate that thing up. It's full of all kinds of um, references to a lot of um, Jewish thought that's been percolating for thousands of years, and he kind of gave visual expression to those things. I thought it was just terrifically thoughtful. Anyway, this is not a class about that movie. Uh, what did happen? Here we go. Uh, this is the warning of the flood. When the Lord saw how great was man's wickedness on earth and how no desire in his heart conceived that was ever anything but evil. I mean, and this is something I always like, especially liked about the movie, is that is it possibly the world after the fall of Adam and Eve and before God sent the flood with Noah was much, much worse than it is now. And one of the things I liked about the Noah movie is, you remember, human beings were so, were so vile that the earth was, was not working anymore. And remember, Noah Noah had a particular gift of his basic goodness, and he could, he could kind of go down on the ground and actually get things to grow more quickly and things like that. And see, what that reminds me of is when, when God found out about Adam and Eve's sin, he said, you know, the ground is cursed because of you. He's saying it's not just your little sin isn't just confined to your measly little soul. The consequences of, of your sin have rippled out throughout the, the whole eternity of my creation. You have ruined everything. I know how you probably thought that you, I just took a little bite of some fruit. No, you ruined the entire project. I dignified you, you with being able to make moral choices. I gave you all this power. You have fabulously misused it. Now the ground is cursed. It is a physical consequence of a moral decision that was not limited to just the human being who committed the sin. So then, of course, you see, in, especially in the Noah movies, that, man, it was hard to make, make stuff come up out of the ground. And, and Noah had that kind of gift. So then what happens, of course, is the, it, it says God grieved that he had made man on the earth. How awful everything must have gotten. Not to say that maybe things are worse now. So the Lord said, I will wipe, it out, wipe out from the earth the men whom I have created. Not only the men, but also the beasts and the creeping things and the birds of the air, for I'm sorry I made them. And see, so he's kind of recapitulating how he made the first Eden in the first place. Like, I'm, 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 all those little steps I took, I'm canceling all that stuff out. And it says, in the eyes of God, the earth was corrupt and full of lawlessness. And when he saw how corrupt the earth had been, all the mortals led depraved lives on earth. But except for Noah and his family. So Noah found favor with God, and he said, make yourself an ark of gopher wood and line it inside out with pitch. And y'all know the rest of the story. Now, this is kind of interesting. Here's Noah's ark. There you go, and look. There's like a couple of giraffes on the back. All right, there's Noah's ark. Now, I love this is the Hebrew word for, for the ark is a tebah. And this word is only used two times in the entire Old Testament, which is kind of cool because we'll see the second time it shows up. Now, a tebah actually doesn't have anything to do with boats. A tebah is just a chest or a container. And it's such an old word that they're not even sure what the, what, the, what the real root of it is. It has almost no applications outside of these two uses in the Old Testament. And what they're saying is that this ark is a boat because there's going to be a flood. So in, essentially it's a, a box which floats. People will tend to conflate an ark with, with Noah's ark and think arks have to float. No, arks don't have to float. They just have to contain something very precious. So that's what happens here. And y'all know pretty much know the story that I don't think there's any, anything else particularly compelling about that, except remember it's the same thing. The same theme is Noah and all the animals, some clean and some clean, unclean, are in the ark, and Noah's family who's found favor with God. So it's the same deal. Is everybody on the outside when the rain starts are crying hefty tears because they're not in the ark. And they can't get into the ark, no matter how badly they would like to get in the ark. They didn't get into the ark because they're depraved and they're sinful and they're bad. And at least in relative terms, Noah is not. So he gets to be on the inside of the ark. Now, let's see. The third ark. Ooh, we're going fast. You know what the third ark is, right? Somebody's going to guess. Anybody that knows, somebody's going to guess the third ark. Moses. Noah, Moses. Yeah, see, I can't even be trusted. Yeah, Moses is the next ark. And it's kind of similar to this one. And even uh, one of the details is kind of sweet about it, which I'm going to get to in just a second. Uh, let's see. Remember what was happening? The whole reason that, that, that Moses had to go into hiding was because, because the Hebrews, who had, by this point had left the promised land, they hadn't gotten to what was the promised land yet. They simply left the Levant and had come down to Egypt because there had been a famine. And remind me, if there's a famine, why do people come to Egypt? 
What's the cause of a famine usually? No water. No water. So why would you go to Egypt? The Nile. Because the Nile River always has water. Yeah. So they went to they went to Egypt. They did such a good job of observing the first commandment, be fruitful and multiply, that the <laughs> Egyptians began to get queasy. They thought, well, oh, these Hebrews are going to take over. They keep having all these doggone babies. And and so the first thing is 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 the Pharaoh told the, the midwife says, you start killing all those babies. And the midwife came back and says, well, we, we, we can't. They have the babies before we can get there. So don't blame us. Anyway, he finally got fed up. And um, you know they started killing little babies, which is why Moses' mama hid him. So it says, I remember this little part. Pharaoh commanded all his subjects throw into the river every boy that is born to the Hebrews, but you can let the girls live. Yeah, that's, that's, that's wholesome. Anyway, so it says that, a certain man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman who conceived and bore a son. Seeing that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months, but neither the poor kid, he was too robust. He wasn't going to stay small forever. Finally, she took a papyrus basket and daubed it with pitch. It's the same thing that, that Moses was told, build, build this out of gopher wood and daub it with pitch. In fact, if you notice in the movie, they paid a lot of attention to the whole process of taking that gigantic box, that gigantic divide, daubing it with pitch. It's too bad they didn't go to Noah because then you could have dogged that with pitch too. But those little connections are kind of fun. Anyway, so here's a little Mo Noah's Ark. It's just almost exactly the same, except it's made out of out of reeds. So there's a little Noah, let's see. Noah's not a very happy child. Ah, he's crying. His arm is sticking out. His feet are sticking out. There's a little Noah floating down the Nile River. He's not happy. This is another classic Ark. Is what's inside the Ark is very, very precious, and what outside is not as precious as, as what's in the Ark. What do you mean, Moses? Moses, I can never be trusted. I, I, yes, I mean, I require constant correction. Yes, I mean Moses. Even the, look, even the sixth graders, even the sixth graders are always jumping down my throat. No, that, you said the wrong thing. I said, oh, that's right. That, that obliges you all pay attention. So anyway, there's Moses and his little ark. Now things start to be kind of fun. Uh, now remember, Moses grew up, and ultimately God gave him an assignment that he didn't ask for. Um, remember, no, Moses had gotten away and had, had married, uh, I think he married Jethro's daughter, uh, Zipporah. I just love that name. When my, when my wife was pregnant, I said, I want you to name, we want to name our baby Zipporah or Evangeline. She said, forget about it. I have the baby. I named the baby. So she named the baby Francesca, which is a nice name, but I still have a, a soft spot for Zipporah. I thought it would be fun to have a little, oh, darling, you call her Zippy. Anyway, <laughs> he was married. <laughs> So Moses was married to Zipporah. He is mine in his own life. He was having a good time tending his father-in-law's herds. He didn't need to be disturbed about anything. And of course, then God had the burning bush and Moses, being a human being, just couldn't ignore that. Oh, I got to see that. And then, you know, the next thing he finds out, first of all, remember, I love this little part because remember, the ground is cursed. Ever since Adam, the ground is cursed. And so what does God tell Moses when he comes close? Just take off your shoes. This is holy ground. You yeah, don't bring me all your all the sheep sheep poo poo on the on the bottom of your feet. That's okay for the rest of the world. Well, you start getting around my burning bush. I have got a holy bubble around this. You know you have to you have to respect the holy bubble around the, around the burning bush. So okay, he takes his takes his shoes off, and then God says, you know, you need to go back and rescue all all your kinsmen down there in Egypt. He says, no, no, that's not my job. He says, oh yes, it is. He says, no, I didn't ask for that job. He says, oh, no, I didn't care. I didn't ask you. I told you. So he goes down there. You know the story. Brings him back now. Um, here you go. Oh, y'all know what body of water that is? <laughs> it's it's the got to do with Moses. Red sea. The Red Sea. That's right. Okay. So Moses and the people, they cross over the Red Sea. Now they're in the Sinai Peninsula. Look, there's the peninsula. Uh, let's see, there's the Red Sea. Mediterranean's up here. There, that's not so bad. And then the Jordan River's over here, which they're going to cross in 40 years. Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee. There. So, they spent a certain amount of time wandering in the desert. And remember, we covered this a little bit last week about God said, well, I want to, I'm going to live with you. I love you. You're my people. I want to dwell with you. And remember, because these people wandered, what did they live in? They lived in tents. And remember, the tent is not so much to protect you from the rain as to protect you from the sun. And God said, okay, I want to live with you. But you have to build me a beautiful, beautiful tent that's patterned on kind of how I live up in heaven. So, of course, it was, it was a very, very spectacular tent. And I'm going to go ahead and erase this because you know, all the grown-ups can keep up. You just have to remember no one was eaten. Okay? Don't forget that. So we have over here, we have the, the, the meeting tent. And it's very, very fabulous. 
And what's inside, we have to go over this again, is the ark. And remember, the ark was so fine. It was made of the most fabulous acacia wood. And it was lined inside out with gold. And then there were four gold rings on each of the four corners. And there were poles of acacia wood. And they were plated in gold. And